some awesome singing. Uh, you know, we be called Jacob BB White Chocolate. Because that boy, because he's getting up for Jacob and all the song leaders right there. Well, I'm excited to get into the Word of God. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1. In verse 17, the later part of verse 17, the Bible says, give me an amen when you're there. Amen. 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 The Bible says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. What an amazing passage we see right here. The words of Jesus Christ, the true gospel, that yes, indeed, God came down from heaven and became a man. And then he went on a cross and died for our sins. But he says that death could not overtake him. That he rose from the dead and you do not need to be afraid because God is alive. That's what separates Christianity from any other religion. If you look at Buddha's tomb, you will find his bones. If you look at Confucius' tomb, you will find his bones. If you look at Muhammad's tomb, you will find his bones. But you look at the tomb of Jesus Christ, you will not find his bones because he is risen. The title of our lesson here this morning is simply Resurrection. I hope you're excited to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what Easter is all about, after all. Not chocolate and Easter bunnies, amen? I, I think we had a pretty awesome service thus far, have we not? Uh, the welcome by the Collinwars was absolutely ecstatic. Let's give it up for the Collinwars one more time right there. And, and it was so awesome to have our mother in the faith, Elena McKean, share her heart for communion. And what, what a heart-moving communion by Elena. I hope you guys were all moved to the cross. Let's give it up for Elena one more time. And Paco has some good short remarks there for contributions. Let's give it up for Paco Garcia. Uh, but it was very exciting to see what God is doing all around the world in the Good News Network. And it's amazing to see what God is doing and see many people come to Christ. Well, I'm excited again to the Word of God here this morning. Let's turn to Matthew 27. We're going to read the account and discuss the account of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. First point, the qualification for resurrection. Verse 32, the Bible says, as they're going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. Matthew 27, verse 32. Now we're in verse 33. <laughs> Just make sure you guys all caught that. Amen. <laughs> Anyways. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the school. They offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting, he refused to drink it. When they crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. You see a, a very ominous scene. For those of you who know what ominous means, that's for the UCLA students and the USC students maybe. Just, just joking. I went to UC Merced. I, I, you guys are a lot smarter than me. But ominous means giving the impression that something bad or unpleasant is going to happen. He says that he goes to Golgotha, which if you look at a picture of it, it literally is a hill in the shape of a skull. And Jesus is badly beaten before he goes to the cross. So much so he cannot carry this 110-pound cross up 
They needed help to take it up. And Simon from Cyrene helps him. And then he's there and there's two robbers sitting at his right and his left who are also on the cross. It's an interesting phrase that we see in the Gospels, just to be at the right and the left of Jesus Christ. We know that the Sons of Thunder, James and John, had that request to be at the right and the left of Jesus. But what did that mean? Well, you said you must drink this. Can you drink this cup? Well, the cup he was referring to was the cup of the cross. Because those who sit at the right and the left of Jesus will be on the cross with them. Let's continue reading verse 44. The Bible says, In the same way the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Verse 45. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. So this is not just an eclipse. It's absolute darkness in the Middle East. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it up with wine and vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the, that, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rock split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many all the people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the son of God. What a powerful scene we, we see over here. In absolute darkness, Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We know this is the moment where he takes all of sin of all mankind on him. And we know from Isaiah 59 that God is, has nothing to do with sin, and sin separates us from God. So for a very brief moment, the Trinity was broken. And God was separated from Jesus. And in Matthew's account, this is the time where he accounts Jesus yelling, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at this moment, he dies. And there's many seismic events that occur at the same time. We talked about the darkness already. And then when they're at that hill in Golgotha, they're able to see the temple. And the temple, there was a curtain that will be its entrance. And it was a huge curtain that Josephus, who was a historian at the time, said it was four inches thick. And it said this huge curtain. Can you imagine that there's a curtain that covered all of this, was torn from top to bottom, showing that it was God who tore it. Wow. If that wasn't enough, a huge earthquake occurs. If that wasn't enough, there are people who raise from the dead and start to walk out of their tombs and appear to people after his resurrection. And when they all see this, they say, surely he was the son of God. Well, we know the Gospels have different parallel accounts. Let's look at another one in Mark 15. Mark 15, in verse 37. We're going to be jumping around here, so hope you can keep up with me here. Mark 15, verse, verse 37. The Bible says, With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 
And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Okay, wow. What we saw in Matthew was it focused on everyone over there. In the book of Mark, it just focused on the Roman centurion and his estimation that Jesus Christ surely was the son of God. Let's now go to John 19. John 19 and verse 30. In verse 30, the Bible says John 19. When he received the dream, Jesus said, it is finished. And we know he didn't just whisper that. It was a loud cry from Mark 15. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath, because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers, therefore, came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so you also may believe. These things happen so that the scripture will be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, and as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. What an amazing passage, and we get a timeline from this. When someone was crucified, usually they will kill them by crucifracture. They'll break their legs, and they'll speed up their death, and they'll die. But what happens when they get to Jesus, he is already dead. But the two thieves, they had to break their legs because they were not dead yet. What does that teach us? Both of the thieves saw it all. They saw people raised from the dead. They saw the seismic earthquake. They saw all these things. But we understand, we have to turn there, but from Luke 23, that yes, indeed, both of them hurled insults to Jesus. But there was one that rebuked the other and professed his faith, and Jesus said, you be with me in paradise. But it's quite interesting because here are two men with the same circumstance, saw the same thing, but had a totally different response. Your circumstances has nothing to do on whether or not you're going to obey Jesus. After this service today, I mean, it's Easter. Some people just come to church on Easter. We call them Christers right there. Christmas, Easter, or when I'm having a hard time. And after this service, you're going to have an opportunity. Whether or not you're going to obey Jesus. Are you going to be like the thief that mocked him? Or are you going to be like the thief that repented? Now, sadly, many people will come to a service just like this. And hear a preacher from a pulpit just like this. Preach that all you got to do is profess your faith and believe. And they'll reference the thief on the cross and they'll say that will qualify you for resurrection. But we have to understand, what does the Bible really teach? Does someone just have to say a, a sinner's prayer right there? And all the, many churches are going to have an altar call. You know, after the, the preacher preaches... There's going to be the, Chris, the, the, the Christian rock band come up. They're going to dim the lights right there. Then they're going to say, everyone, just bow down and bow your heads and, and, and close your eyes. If you want to profess Jesus, your personal Lord and Savior, please raise your hand and let's come up here and say this prayer. I said that prayer a hundred times. I prayed Jesus because I was like, man, I'll pray Jesus and I'll get right back into sin. And I feel like the Lord left me. And I was like, I can't pray it into my heart again. I said that prayer so many times, but never changed. What does the Bible teach? Matthew chapter 9, 
the Bible says that Jesus, while he was on earth, has authority to forgive sins. So if the Lord said it, that's gospel. The thief went to heaven. But what does the Bible say how you respond to the gospel right after Jesus Christ died? Because now I can't go and visit Jesus physically, but the Bible will say Jesus is right here. He's alive. He gave you the word so that you can obey it. So what does the word of God say? How does someone respond to the true gospel of Jesus Christ? Let's turn to Acts chapter 2. You ever heard me preach? I love this one. In Acts 2, now Jesus died, he's been buried, and he resurrected. And he goes up to heaven and tells them, don't leave Jerusalem because power from on high is going to come. And the kingdom of God is going to be ushered in. So the scene is, the apostles are there at the day of Pentecost, with many scholars believe millions of people are there, hearing the first time ever, first time, the, the gospel of Christ was preached, the death of burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's see what does Peter say who had the keys to the kingdom in verse 36. Therefore, let all ears will be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God would call. Many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. What, what was the gospel? Well, Peter says that you guys, we killed Jesus. It just happened right there just a month ago. But it's still true of us because of our sin, because of what we wanted to do. We put Jesus Christ on the cross. And, and these men and women, they were cut to the heart. We killed the king of the kingdom. We killed the Alpha and the Omega. We killed God. And they asked, what do I got to do to reconcile myself? And Peter tells them the simple words, repent and be baptized. For the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What is the qualification of resurrection? Well, the Bible teaches right here. Someone must have faith, they must repent, and they must be baptized. But many will say, well, the thief on the cross was not baptized. Well, then why, why, why should I? I? Was baptism necessary for salvation? Let's go to Romans chapter 6. <laughs> What does the Bible teach that baptism is? This is not my message. This is God's message. This is not about me. It's about the Lord. I'm not here to shoot anyone down, but we got to have the word of God as a standard. Amen. It says in verse 1, what shall we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means that's cheap grace. How can we live in any longer? Don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried them through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like this. Remember our point, the qualification of resurrection. The Bible here teaches us that when someone gets baptized, they spiritually participate in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible actually never teaches that it's supposed to be an outward sign of an inward grace. The Bible says that spiritually speaking, when someone gets baptized in faith, they participate in the death, they participate in the burial, and they resurrect to a new life with the Holy Spirit. That's how someone is now qualified for resurrection. 
It's simple. Someone has to be baptized as a disciple. I remember when I, I grew up with leaders, but no one ever showed me this before. And then a disciple came to me. And July 31st, 2016, I got baptized into Christ. And I had to just accept that these were past traditions. The whole idea of being saved by a sinner's prayer is only 300 years old. You could do history on it. There was men that provided this new doctrine to fill up the seats in church. And then I had to put my traditions away and then see the true convictions of the word of God. Because I want to be qualified for resurrection. But it's amazing to see all those who are coming to Christ all around the world. I hope you're praying for the movement. I don't know about you, but I, I pray for the move. I pray for all the disciples all around the world. I mean, today, there is a man in China who was an agnostic, who was agnostic. His name is David, and he got baptized into Christ. And then over there in Salt Lake City, a guy named Muhammad, he's getting baptized into Christ today. And it was awesome this past Wednesday, locally over here at USC Student Karina, she was baptized into Christ. And it's amazing, you got a Chinese agnostic, a guy named Muhammad, a woman who was in the Christian realm but didn't understand what it meant to be baptized as a disciple, all three of them got baptized. What does that teach us? Jesus is for all nations. Well, a, a very special family announcement. Uh, we, we had a brother wh who, was, who was with us, but came to a realization that prior to his baptism, he never really became a disciple. And, and, and what happened during that time that like he was with us, he wasn't living like a disciple. Here's the thing about our church. We love deeply. We, we're a family. We love God. We love people. But, but, but the Bible's our standard. And there's an expectation for everyone to live from the Bible. And this brother came to me and said like, he was not. But he, he made a decision to get radical. He made a decision to get urgent. And last week, Friday, he got his, himself right with God, yeah. and our brother Mike Hall got baptized into Christ. Yeah. And I, I know we all love Mike. And I, I know we all, you know, we, we, we've seen him in the fellowship. But I'm proud of Mike. He, wanted, he just wanted to play the game. He just wanted to make sure that he was qualified for resurrection. And he got into the word of God. He studied it out. We studied with him, and he got himself right with God. My question is, what about you? Are you sure of it, that you're qualified for resurrection? Are you sure of it, that if God came back, I just can't imagine it. If God came back today, or we died, are you sure you'll go to heaven? If there is something in your heart that is irking you here, I want to encourage you. It's not by chance that we're here today. Right. Acts 17 says that God sets the times and places, that if you're alive, He's not done with you yet. But it's time for us to get into the word of God, study it out, and make sure that your convictions from the word of God, not convictions from traditions. Let's study the Bible. Let's get into the word of God. And let's be sure of it, that we are qualified for resurrection. Are you guys with me here? Well, once we're qualified, we could go to point number two. The transformation from resurrection. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15. In verse 1. If you know about the church of Corinth, it's absolutely messed up. 
there was many sinful things that were happening there. You can read it on your own. Now, Paul ends the letter with 1 Corinthians 15. And I find it quite inspiring that he chose this to spur the church on. First one, the transformation from resurrection. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you believed in vain. For I received, I pass on to you as a first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters, and, and at the same time, most of them who are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and don't even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. The gospel is indeed that God is alive. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul simply says that if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, our faith is useless. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, what we're doing here is just a show. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, being a Christian is probably the most foolish thing you could possibly do in your life. But because the fact is that Jesus raised from the dead, this becomes the truth of the universe. And it's interesting what Paul said. He says, according to the scriptures, that's how we know Jesus raised from the dead. Well, there's so many passages. Acts 1 verse 3 says that Jesus gave many convincing proof that he was alive. Acts 17 says that Paul was able to explain and prove that Jesus was the Messiah. Well, how, how did they do this? Well, in Acts 2, Peter quoted Psalm 16. That was written in 970 BC. That's 970 years before Jesus Christ was born. And the Bible prophesies that God will not abandon Jesus in dead, and he will indeed raise him from the dead. And in Hosea 6, the Bible prophesies that he would do it in three days, according to the scriptures. But perhaps the most convincing proof to the pagan or non-believer is understanding what these men did and what they were before the resurrection. Peter was a man who denied Jesus three times to little girls. Saul, who became Paul, little girls. Saul became Paul. He was a Christian murderer. He murdered, and this is not just some fairy tales. This is history. This absolutely happened. But then they said that we saw Jesus. There were eyewitness testimonies. And they said because we saw him, they totally changed their lives. Peter went from coward to courageous. Thomas, who was another apostle, went from doubter to preacher. Saul went from murderer to proclaimer. And then what's amazing is that they all died a martyr's death. Peter was crucified upside down next to his wife, who's also crucified. Paul was beheaded. Every single one of the apostles died a martyr's death except for one. And you may ask, what happened to the other guy? John, the apostle, who wrote the book of John, was thrown into a hot, boiling pot of oil. And he survived. This is history. You can look this stuff up. And they were like, what do we do with this guy? So they, they just put him in the, in the island of Patmos, and, just, and that's where he wrote the book of Revelation. What does that teach us? You can't die until God's done with you. you today. Is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection a fact to you? Are you fully convinced that God came down from heaven? 
He died for you, and he resurrected. I gotta say, that, that, if we really believe that, that's gonna change our lives. There will be a great transformation from the resurrection. And that's exactly what happened to Paul. He says that the grace of God was not without effect in my life. He said, I worked harder than all of them. Who did he talk talk about? The other apostles. And he said, because it was the grace of God. What does that teach us? Grace motivates. We're compelled by the love of God to share our faith. We're compelled by the love of God to have our quiet times. We're compelled by the love of God to go out and study the Bible with people. We're compelled by the love of God to obey God. That's what the Bible says after all. True love for God is this, is to obey his commands. It's the love of God in our hearts. And it says that we obey him and it's not burdensome. If you really love someone, it's not going to be a burden. See, I love my wife. My wife is amazing. It's not a burden to lead her. It's not a burden to serve her. It's not a burden to be with her. But some of us make being a Christian a burden. What, 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 what does that mean? It means there's a lack of love in your heart. There's a lack of grace. There's a, there's, there's, the, the grace of God has lost its effect. How about it? But for those maybe who, who've you've been in many services, you've been studying the Bible, has the, has the grace of God affected your heart yet? Wow. Has, it, has it got you to do something? At first, as disciples, is the grace of God beating, is it the anthem of your heart? Or maybe some of us have truly just left the grace of God and have chosen to walk away from the Lord. Wow. The grace of God, which you once tasted sweet fellowship, and right now, God is he's, he's trying to pierce your heart to come back. Don't let the grace of God be without effect in your life. You know, I, I once heard an, an old preacher tell a true story about two brothers in El Paso, Texas. Their ages were five and two. One day, they were playing outside next to a tree. And it was a gusty day over there in Texas. And while they're under this tree, the wind hits a branch and it breaks the branch. The five-year-old older brother, he sees his little brother about to get squashed by this branch. He runs, pushes him out of the way, and that branch falls on him. And he dies. His father said his last words were, it hurts so bad. His father, not knowing what to do, chose to not tell his younger son what happened. But of course, younger son grows older and finds a picture amongst the family. And he sees another boy with him. And he asks his father, who is that boy? And his father starts to cry. He says, that, that was your older brother. And he died saving your life. We know from the Bible that yes, indeed, God is our father. And the book of Hebrews would teach us that Jesus Christ is our older brother. And just like how that older brother died for him from that branch, Jesus, died, Jesus went on a branch and died for us. But the question is, what are we going to do about it? Is the cross still in your heart? That our, our, our Lord, our older brother, our father, he died for us. That's why we do what we do. That's why we are disciples of Jesus. Now we want to challenge the Metro Coast. It, it's been amazing to see what God has done in the city of angels, and, and all around the world for that matter. Um, and to see what God has done over here in the Metro Coast. Uh, through your faith in the last 14 weeks, we've seen 22 people get baptized into Christ. Now, that's amazing. That's awesome. And we, we praise God for every baptism. 
but we need some spurring on. And this is, this is why the Lord has us in church. He says, can, don't, don't miss church so you can get spurred on. You know what a spur is? It means you get kicked in the groin and you run a little faster. That's what a spur is for a horse. 22 baptisms, awesome. But that's about one and a half baptisms a week. And we have 170 sold out disciples in the Metro Coast. What are we saying then? It takes 170 disciples to see one baptism a week. I think there's something wrong there. Right now in the Southland, we have eight Bible talks. In the West, we have five. And Bible talks are, is, is our small groups that we are, it's emblematic of Jesus and his apostles so we could go out and evangelize. That's a total of 13 Bible talks in the Metro Coast. I, I believe a great goal for a Bible talk, and this is just bare minimum, is to be fruitful every month. And if we have 13 in the Metro Coast, that will be 13 baptisms a month. That would be about three or four baptisms a week. I want to challenge us here to be motivated by the grace of God, to not let the grace of God be without effect in your life, to work harder so we can see more souls be saved to the glory of our Father in heaven. People, people want to person say they're talking about numbers, talking about numbers. Jesus talked about numbers. Every number is a soul. I mean, the first baptism of, of the South Atlanta was, was Bryce. And Bryce got baptized in January. I remember seeing Trey get baptized. I remember seeing Chino get baptized. Uh, I remember seeing Lori getting baptized. All these people got baptized this year. And it's amazing to see, but all those numbers, they're souls. Who are, who's the next Bryce? Who's the next Chino? I don't know if anyone's like Chino, but who, who, could, who, could, be the, who could be the next Chino? Chino's hilarious. She's, she's, she's so, like, who, 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 who's the next? We got to go with the grace of God to find those lost souls. And we know if we do that, we can do point number three. The expectation of resurrection. Let's see how 1 Corinthians 15 closes out. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. I thought this was, this was pretty cool. Verse 50 says, I declare to you, brothers, the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. What, a, what, a, what an encouraging passage. It says that, that there's, Jesus has a victory over death. And it's amazing. It says that we must clothe ourselves with the imperishable. And I thought about that. Well, what does that mean? Well, kind of going back to our first point. Galatians 3, 26 to 27 says that when you're baptized into Christ, you clothe yourself with Christ. So for those that are going to have imperishable clothes is when you get baptized and stay faithful to the Lord. And it's amazing over here what he says is that the mortal will become immortal. Where, oh, death is your victory. Where, oh, death, is your sting? Famous line from a Greek poet at the time. And then the, 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 the encouragement is that when we have our hope in heaven, we can give ourselves fully to the Lord. When we have our hope in the expectation of resurrection, 
That's when we give our hearts to God. But sometimes our hope could get into other things. Sometimes our hope could get into our jobs. And we get distracted. We don't give ourselves fully to the Lord. Sometimes our hope could get into school. And we don't give ourselves wholly to God. Sometimes our hope could get into finding that special somebody. And not give ourselves fully to the Lord. The Bible says the only way to give yourself fully to the Lord, to stand firm, is to have your hope in heaven. Are you excited to go to heaven one day? You know, it's amazing this past week, Virginia and I got a chance to uh, visit the, the Woman of Wisdom Bible Talk led by Lisa Davis. And Virginia and I are kind of making a tour around all the Bible talks and building family, and it's been, it's been a fun time. Uh, on tour. <laughs> uh, it's, been, it's been fun. To, it was really awesome. Uh, it's, they, they were a blast. Uh, we went over to Brenda's house, and um, I, I, was, I was so encouraged. Because um, the, 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 the banter of the woman of wisdom is like no other. I thought the brothers had some banter. But they were really showing us how it's done there. I was, I, my, my jaw hurt at the end. I was laughing so hard. Uh, but it was, it was awesome. It was amazing there. We, we preached a lesson to them called resurrection. And we had three points. Resurrected vision, resurrect, resurrected love, and resurrected unity. And it was so awesome just to see the smiles on the women of wisdom's faces. And we closed out in the book of Philippians about a man whose name is so hard to pronounce, I'm going to give it a shot. It's Epaphroditus, obscure, obscure character in the scriptures. But the Bible says that Paul wanted to send Epaphroditus to the church in Philippi to help strengthen it. Why was that? Because the man was ill before. He was sick and almost died, but then God healed him. Wow. And, he, and the Bible said because God healed him, there was such a conviction there that he went and helped strengthen the church in Philippi. Wow. And what we taught from that passage was Epaphroditus knew his time was short. And because he knew his time was short, he was encouraged to go even harder. And I know the woman of wisdom over there, they're encouraged, they're inspired to go out with the blazing chariot of fire and close out with a bang and see many more come to Christ. I know they're gonna see some great addition to the woman of wisdom Bible talk. But then after they all shared, it was just, it was just something so awesome to hear. They're just like, man, I, I, just can't, I, I can't wait to go to heaven. I think sometimes, it's, I mean, I'm, say I'm, I'm a young person, it, it, we could get so tricked out that we think our life is so long. It's not. <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> you know what the Bible says that life is? Thank you, Michael. The, 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 the Bible says our life is like a mist. You ever spray for breeze in the bathroom? That's your life? It's nothing but a Febreze spray. He just sprays, dwindles down. True life is the eternal. And we're either going to be with God forever. Just match, match that. Or we're not. And the other, the other option is it's terrible. I hope that we can have a great expectation for resurrection. That as we go out to our campuses, go out to our, our, our workplaces, to have in your heart that if you're a sold out disciple, you're going to go to heaven one day. And when you invite someone to Bible talk, when you invite them to church, when you invite them to do a Bible study, you're not just inviting them to some group discussion on campus. You're not just inviting them to some group discussion in your home. You're not just inviting them to do a little cute little Bible study. You're inviting them to punch their ticket into heaven one day. You're inviting them one day to become immortal. You're inviting them to have the great expectation of the great resurrection. Let's close on Revelation 21.
we start in Revelation, we got to end in Revelation. Bible says in verse 1, such an amazing passage. It says, then I saw, Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out down from heaven, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They'll be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning, crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down. I'll take some notes today. For these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I'll give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I'll be their God, and they will be my children. What an amazing passage. We can have a conviction that, yes, indeed, Jesus resurrected from the dead. And because of that, right now, he's preparing our rooms in heaven. And one day, we will resurrect with him and be with him forever. That's what resurrection is all about. And to God be the glory. Come on.